If you were with us last week, you remember I began by asking you how many of you have ever heard of a certain word, and the pronunciation I used of that word was a harbinger. Well, I have discovered thus that that is an incorrect pronunciation, so that might have had something to do with how few hands went up when I asked if you'd ever heard of it. But on the other hand, even though I now know the correct pronunciation, I'd still never heard of it. But it's not a harbinger, it's a harbinger. And a harbinger basically is something that has been foretold like a prophecy that comes to pass. I also had shared with you last week that for the next couple of weeks, in light of uh, this study that God had revealed to me that this Messianic Jew, Jonathan Cahn, has done, and the two books that he's written based on those studies, that we were going to be looking at that over the next couple of weeks. I have thus discovered it's just too much information to try and do on a Sunday morning series. So I will share with you uh, just a little tidbit, and then I'm going to leave it with you, and if we come back to it, it would probably have to be something I'd have to do on a Sunday evening. But the book and the term I was referring to, the two words, remember last week I said I'm going to share one, that was the harbinger, and then the second is today. And it's a Jewish word, and the word is Shemitah. Now, I don't know how many of you have, have ever heard of that word, but the word Shemitah, it basically, it represents kind of a multitude of things in the Jewish calendar. First, the Shemitah is the Sabbath day. The day of rest, when God commanded from the very beginning that man was to work for six days, and on the Sabbath he was to rest. He was to do no work, as well as any of his servants. The Shemitah is also that God commanded Israel, and Israel only, that we find in his word, as a nation that was chosen specifically by him, that not only the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, but every seven years that Israel was supposed to take a Sabbath for the whole year. Farmers weren't supposed to farm the land. No trades and businesses were supposed to take place. Basically, on this seventh year, all the accounts were going to be settled. If you owed somebody money and you hadn't finished paying them back, your debt was wiped clean. All the slates, and it basically the purpose of this seven-year Shemitah was to take everybody back down to zero. Now, why would God want to do that? To remind everybody, and especially his people, that this world and everything in it is his, not ours. That we came into the world with nothing and that we're going out with nothing. And so by every seven years, basically diversifying yourself and uh, canceling all debts and so on and so forth, taking a year off from farming, you basically, by the end of that year, everybody was pretty much broke starting back from scratch again and it was a reminder that it's all God's can you imagine what our nation would be like today if every seven years we honored something like this now the fascinating part to me is not only what all that represents but especially how it applies to our nation and that's the part that Jonathan Kahn has spent the last years since basically we were attacked on 2001 researching and applying it to the United States of America now again in God's Word we see that the only nation he ever commanded to recognize these Shemitahs was the nation of Israel so we think okay well what's that exactly got to do with us if you really know the history of our nation and you go back and really read the details of what the founding fathers of this nation and the majority of people at that time believed about this nation, that they were coming here to start a nation of people for God. And one of the terms that many of the forefathers even used about the United States was that we will be the new Israel. And so in light of that, and I believe God recognized it and honored it, but with it comes also, I believe, some of the regulations and precepts that go along with the nation Israel. God says, if you're going to choose to be my nation, just like I chose Israel, they didn't choose me, I chose them. But if you as a group of people of starting Americans, and we know we were all immigrants, but if you're going to choose to be a nation to represent me, awesome, awesome, I'm with you but there's some stipulations that come with it. 
And so what Jonathan Kahn has done is basically went back and studied the history of our nation from its inception until current day based on this Shemitah. And every significant event that has ever happened in this nation, both good and bad, positive and negative, can be tied to this seven-year calendar. The book is titled The Mystery of the Shemitah. Now, he will tell you in that book, he is not predicting anything. He's recording and telling you what has already happened and how he believes it lines up with God's Word. He doesn't talk about, well, he makes reference to Christ's return, but that does not have anything to do with the book. It's about this Shemitah. But keep in mind, the Shemitah comes from God's Word, and in God's Word, everything ties to Jesus Christ and to his return. And so in light of all that, I share that with you. I highly encourage you, if you want to be astounded, astonished, fascinated in awe at what's happened in this nation, both positively and negatively, and how it connects with this thing, I highly encourage you to purchase and read the book, The Mystery of the Shemitah. But I hope your faith is where it's supposed to be. Because what he is discovering now is, all these things and all the blessings that come with, if you choose, God basically said, if you choose to willfully take this Shemitah, honor the seventh year, I'm going to bless you for it. Matter of fact, I'm going to bless you so much in the sixth year, you don't have to worry about what you don't get in the seventh. But if you choose not to do it, if you willfully choose not to give it up, I'm going to take it by force. And it usually comes in the forms of judgment. And that's what he believes is transpiring in our nation today. But the great news is with God, there's always hope. We always hope that we can change, that the church can rise up and do what we're supposed to do, and that this nation can turn back to the foundation on which we came. And that just like God would relent as he always does in his word. All right, take your Bibles and stand with me this morning. Loud and strong, this is my Bible, the light into my path. I believe it is the indestructible, inexhaustible, infallible Word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I could do. My mind is alert. My ears are open. My heart is receptive to receive God's Word. Today I will be forever changed. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in light of what I shared with you, if you were here last week, also, in light of that, I felt led and we looked at Matthew 25 and the parable of the ten virgins. Today we're going to come back to this and look at the next parable in this same chapter that Jesus goes into. And though it does relate, I guess, in the sense, at least indirectly, to end times, it has much more to do with present time. What are we doing right here, right now, with what we have? So let's begin. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14. Remember in in the first part, in chapter 25, the verse 1, Jesus said, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable. So he's talking about, remember, the setting for this whole thing is, that they had come out of the temple, I believe, and shared with you last week, it was the last time Jesus had overturned the tables, that the mood was kind of quiet. They didn't know what to say, so they start complimenting the temple and pointing it out to Jesus and how awesome it is. And he basically begins to tell them, listen, not one stone's going to be left on another. This whole thing's going to be tore down as well as this city. And then he tells them about the things that will happen for the end times and his return. And they begin to say, well, Lord, when are these things going to happen and when are we going to know? And so he goes into these parables talking about this is what the kingdom of heaven will be like. Last week we looked at it being comparable to ten virgins who were waiting on the groom to arrive. This week he looks, or I mean this in our text this morning, he compares it to a man going on a journey. Verse 14 again. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. 
and he went on his journey. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you do not sow, and gathering where you do, had scattered no seed. And I was afraid. And I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take the talent away from him. And give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Father, as we look into your word today and as we look back into the words of Christ that he gave to the disciples then and us now, as they were wondering, Lord, about all the things that were taking place, all the events, they saw the cruelty and the unfairness of times of the Roman government. They saw the corruption that surrounded everything. They saw, Father, all these things that are happening in their society. And then they heard from their Savior himself that their greatest thing, the temple, would be destroyed as well as the city. And so, Lord, I'm sure just like us, they were wondering, somewhat confused, concerned. When are these things going to happen? What's going to take place? What's going to happen to us? But, Father, he told them then and he tells us this morning to be ready. So help us, we pray, pray as we look into this parable this day, to understand the depths of what Jesus is seeking to teach us, to understand our responsibility, our faithfulness, and also our reward. We ask you these in all things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Verse 14, it begins and it says, it will be just like a man about to go on a journey. Now, Jesus here basically is using another parable to indicate and explain about future events. The man going on the journey is Jesus himself. And as we walk through this passage this morning, I want us to look at seven different stewardship lessons. The first one comes again from verse 14. It's just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves or servants and entrusted his possessions to them. The first thing we need to see and understand is this. What we have is not ours. What we have is not ours. Notice it says that the master called the slaves or the servants in and entrusted his possessions to them. Now, this was a common thing during those days. Wealthy men would take long journeys. We didn't have airplanes, trains, boats, all these ways they could travel. They would take these journeys to go and do business in various parts of the world. And even when they left, because of the uh, time and travel, they had no idea how long the journey would take. It depended on a whole lot of circumstances that were out of their control. Not like today. We know today for certain if we choose to, we can go get on a plane at 12 o'clock and be in New York at 2 o'clock. It didn't work that way then. They had to go with what was available when they may have to wait for days just to get on a boat going in the direction they needed to travel. And so he, it says that he's going on this journey with no certain time, but it's going to be, at least we know it, 
a long time. And they were expected to bring a return on what had been handed over to them. There is no doubt in the minds of these servants that the property and the money still belonged to the master. They were the possessors, but they weren't the owners. And their job was to manage what they were given. You and I have to remember the same is true for us. Everything is not ours. It's only ours to manage. Psalm 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Haggai 2.8 says, The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord. He has the rights, I have the responsibility. He's the master, I'm the manager. I'm the servant, he's the sovereign. I wonder, have you allowed this, this truth this biblical truth to truly permeate every part of your life. Because until you do, you really won't be a good manager for Him. There's no way you can be a good manager for God if you don't realize that it all belongs to God. We have to understand everything has been entrusted to us. Our days are in His hands. Our gifts and our abilities are on loan from Him. Our money is an advance from the Almighty. Our houses, our clothes, every possession we have really doesn't belong to us. We don't own anything. Second thing. Look at verse 15. The one He gave five talents to another two to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. We're given what we can handle. We see the master gave some of the talents to different, three different servants. And then notice it says, then he went on his journey. He went to do what he needed to do and to take care of his responsibilities. And he wasn't going to worry about the results, at least until he got back. Now, we need to pause here in order to recognize that this word talent is different from the present day talent. Talent today represents what? A gift or a skill or an ability. The talent that is used here, we find it in several places. It's used here, but it's also used in Revelation 16. But in Revelation 16, that's the part in judgment where it's talking about 100-pound hailstones falling out of the sky on top of men. So it's talking about a talent being a weight equivalent to 100 pounds. But when you equate it to money during those times, remember when you're talking about fractions of money that was the minas the pennies when you got on into the silver so to speak the change and the dollars now you're into shekels but when you get into talents you're getting into the thousands now now there's a variation depending on which commentator or uh, philosopher you may agree with on the actual value of this talent that they're referring to much of it depended on whether it was talking about a talent of copper or silver or gold but most commentators would agree that it was a large sum of money a sum that would probably take the average laborer about 20 years to earn so to put this into our economy into our present day using a minimum hourly wage a talent today would be the equivalent of about three hundred thousand dollars okay so now keep that in mind as to what's being entrusted to these servants. One talent is about $300,000. We're focusing this series talking about discovering, developing, deploying, and all these the gifts that God's given us and how we're to invest His money. But a secondary application to how we use God-given talents and supernatural abilities as well as our faithfulness and our trustworthiness. There was a lady who was out sunbathing on the beach one day, just out there by herself, kind of relaxing and enjoying the day. And she noticed this young little boy walking up towards her, and all he had on was a pair of swim trunks, and he had a towel over his shoulder. And he come walking up to her and stopped up beside her towel, and he looked down at her, and he said, Ma'am, do you believe in God? She was kind of taken back and a little surprised, and she said, Yeah, actually I do. And he said, do you go to church every Sunday? And she said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. He said, do you pray and read your Bible every day? And he, she said, well, yeah, if you want to know the truth, I do. 
He said, here, would you mind holding my money while I go swimming? People are watching. And what we do and don't makes a difference. Back to the story. The master gave the first servant five talents, about 1.5 mil. The second guy received two, about 600,000. The third one got one talent, about 300,000. Now, there's a big difference between five talents and one talent. But think about this. The guy who got the one talent still was given the responsibility and entrusted with about $300,000. Pretty significant amount in their day and ours. And that's one thing that ought to remind us that all God always gives out of his abundance to us. But I want you to notice that each servant received the talents according to his ability. To one he gave five, to one he gave two, to another one, each according to his own ability. Your responsibility is always tied to your ability. It's very interesting. God's kingdom purposes do not operate according to what's fair. God's kingdom purposes always operate according to what's best first corinthians 3 5 says what after all is apollos and what is paul only servants for whom you came to believe as the lord has assigned to each his task paul was basically telling the, the church there he said what are you guys doing what's all these clicks i'm hearing about in the church we got a paul click and an apollos click and this click over here and they say i follow apollos and and this group to say well i listen to paul and he said what are y'all talking about do you even understand what you're saying? Each one of us has been assigned a task. Apollos was called to water. I come along and fertilize it, but it's God that makes it grow, and he's the only one that matters. You have what you have because God gave it to you, and he expects you to manage his gifts with the boundaries of ability that he has wired into you. Your responsibility is always tied to your ability. And so God is not going to judge you for not getting up and preaching sermons if he hadn't wired you to get up and preach sermons. God's not going to judge you and look down on you because you don't teach Sunday school if he hasn't put into you the gifts, the abilities, the skills, and the things that you need to teach Sunday school. But he is looking, and he is going to hold us accountable for the responsibilities, for the abilities that he has given us. The third thing. We must invest what we've been given. Look at verse 16. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with him and gained five more talents. It says he went at once and put his money to work. He didn't waste time. Immediately went to work. Whatever his investment strategy was, he doubled his master's portfolio. The guy who got ta two talents did the same thing. He doubled his master's money, ending up with four talents. But verse 18 describes the different approach of the third servant. Look at verse 18. But he who had received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Even though we don't read about any specific instructions as to what they were to do with the money, how they were to invest it, where they were to invest it, all it tells us is the first guys, first two went straight to work and began to multiply their master's money. The one guy talent was a slacker who went and basically just dug a hole and buried it. Now, the practice of hiding valuables in the ground was quite common back then. It was one of the safest ways that you could hide something. But it was also one of the most least profitable because money in the ground don't gain anything. Not even interest. Do you know why he didn't even bother to take it to the bank? Why did he not even bother to take it to the bank? Because it was too much of a bother to him. Too much of a bother. He would have had to actually go out of his way. Wherever he was planning on going when he left the master's presence that day, he didn't change course at all. Just somewhere along the way where he thought he could possibly remember, he just stopped, took him a few scoops of dirt out of the ground, and hit it. 
Because Antonio's voice was high and squeaky, he didn't make the tryouts for the Cremona Boys Choir. When he started taking violin lessons, his neighbors actually persuaded his parents to make him stop. It was driving them crazy. Yet little Antonio still wanted to make music. His friends would even give him a hard time because the only skill that anybody ever saw that he had was whittling. He could take a pocket knife and carve little animals and stuff out of a stick with a piece of wood. But when Antonio got older, he served as an apprentice to a violin maker. And his knack of whittling actually became a skill of carving and his hobby became a craft. He worked patient, patiently and faithfully at it for years. And by the time little Antonio died, he had left behind about 1,500 violins, each one of them bearing a label that reads Antonio Stradivarius. They are the most sought-after violins in the world. Everyone known in existence today is worth at least one million dollars. Little Antonio couldn't sing, he couldn't play, couldn't preach, couldn't teach. But his responsibility was to use his ability. And his violins are still making music all over the world today. Our potential is God's gift to us. What we do with it is our gift to him. Zig Ziglar said many years ago, you are the only person on earth who can use your ability. No one else can do it. Only you. Are you investing with what you've been given, regardless of how much it is? Whether God's entrusted to you five talents or one, or have you buried it and kept it hidden from others? The fourth thing we need to see is that there is a day of accountability coming. Look at verse 19. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. None of us want to be audited by the IRS, but we're all going to be audited one day by the Almighty. We're going to have to give an account for how we use what we've been given. It says, after a long time that he came back. Now, most of us believe this in our heads. We just don't really live with it in our hearts. We believe, yeah, I one day I'm going to have to stand before God and give an account. We, we believe it here. We just don't always let that belief get to here. Because if we would think more about his return, we would have a whole lot more focus on every decision that we make in our life. That there is eternal consequences on our investments, on our time, on our money, our resources. Each of us are going to give an account of himself to God. It was the duty of servants to always bear in mind that their master would be coming back, that they were going to have to settle in accounts with him. And folks, listen, that day is coming for each one of us. I can't promise you a whole lot of certainties in this life, but one absolute I can promise you is this. We're all leaving here, and we're all going to stand before him one day and give an account. And no matter where your journey in life may take you, in the complete and total opposite direction of mine or wherever, they all lead to one final destination point, And that is the throne of God for every single person. I don't know about you, but when that day comes for me, I don't want to be the one that has to be ashamed. I don't want to be the one if there's a crowd of people and we're all waiting our turn or waiting in line that I'm back there in the back kind of staying you know how if you've ever been in a crowd before and everybody's wanting to see the host guy but whoever it may be, and be honest, you really don't. So you kind of try and stay behind everybody and just stay hid back there. I don't know about you, but when that day comes, I don't want that to be me. 1 John 2, 8 says, Now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Serve in light of a future reckoning. I want to be as eager as these first two servants to show my master his return. You know, it would help us to get in the habit of asking the question, how will my money management or this decision to serve or not to serve look on the day that I stand before Christ? Fifth thing, what we do with what we have reveals our view of God. Look at verses 20 through 25 again. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. 
His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed, and I was afraid. And I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. What we do with what we have reveals our view of God. The man who got five, notice his language. He's like, look. Look, master, see, see, I, I, I've got the five you gave me, and I've got five more. The word originally means behold or look. He was eager. He couldn't wait to show his master what he had done. He's bubbling with enthusiasm. He is thoroughly thrilled. He couldn't wait to present and show his master because he wanted his master to be pleased. The man with two talents had the same approach, the same excitement, even with less amount of talent. The master is thrilled with both of them because both of them demonstrated the responsibility for their ability. He says the same exact thing to both of them. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many. You know, Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Notice something here. These two, what they received. The first thing they both received was affirmation. The master said, good job, well done, great, I appreciate your good work, your faithfulness. The second thing they both received was a promotion. He said, you've been faithful with a few things, guess what? You're getting to move up the ladder. Now I'm going to put you in charge of many things. The third thing, the celebration. You've made me happy. Come and enjoy, he says. Come and enjoy the fruits of your labor. Come and enjoy the presence of your master. Come, let's celebrate together. This phrase, well done, can be translated fantastic, awesome. That's what he's telling them. They were faithful and they were called good because they had a right view of the master. Likewise, when we see God for who he is, we will want to be faithful. We will want to focus on doing good things for Him. God is looking for faithful people, for those who properly manage their resources for kingdom purposes. And we're going to be responsible for what we've been given. And then when we are, we're given more responsibilities. I can actually picture a smile on Jesus' face when He says, Come, come and share in your Master's happiness. But notice the one talent guy. He seems to come a little bit more reluctantly to the master. And I want you to notice something else here. Notice the first words out of the first two servants' mouths. Don't look at me. Look back in your Bible a minute. The first two servants, after they say master, What's their next couple of words? Matter of fact, let's pin it down and let's say, after they say master, what's their next two words? You entrusted, both of them. They said the same thing. Where's their focus and their attention at? It's on the master. Master, you entrusted me. Their focus is on him. Notice the third guy. What's his first two words? I knew. His focus is on himself. He ain't really thinking about the master. Notice the first two words. Master, I knew. Do you know why he said I knew? Because he always knew. He's a know-it-all. He always knows. Don't you know them folks? I knew that's what going to happen. I knew that's what you were going to say. I knew this was going to happen if I tried. He knew. The problem is with them and with him, and it applies to all of us. The truth of the matter is we don't know nothing. 
just as we're in control of nothing. He said, I knew you to be a hard man. The problem with when you know and you always know, you often jump to conclusions. And when you jump to conclusions, you begin with false information, and guess what you're going to get? A false accusation or condemnation. How many times have we seen something happen, get mad about it, and think, why in the world, and then somebody comes, oh, oh, we were already mad, didn't know the circumstance, didn't know why, but we were mad because that wasn't supposed to happen. The first words were about himself. I knew. The other two, their first words were right back at the master. Master, you entrusted me. The third guy had a wrong view of the master, and he had his mind made up before he ever even received the talent. He looked at him as someone who was hard and harsh instead of loving and gracious. A.W. Tozier was right many years ago when he said, what you think about God is the most important thing about him. If we view God as a tyrant, then we'll filter everything through that lens. Some of you today may be secretly angry with God because he, you think he did something. Or maybe you think he should have did something that he didn't do. And so our view is skewed. Your preconceived notions prevent you from seeing him as a God of grace. And as a result, you refuse to serve him with what he's given you. When we blame God, we end up burying our blessings, kind of like this guy. It's almost as if he's blaming the master. But he's blaming him with a false assumption. I knew you to be a hard man. But the truth is, he wasn't. A faulty, God can also, a faulty view of God can also lead to excuses. In verse 25, this man declared that the reason he didn't do anything with what he had been given was because he was afraid. That's why. He said, I'm, I was scared, so I didn't do anything. He said, basically, my fear paralyzed me, so all I could do was play it safe. He hid the money to make sure it wouldn't be lost, and he accomplished exactly what he set out to achieve. Nothing. It's like the old saying goes, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. A wrong view of God always leads to fear. I was afraid, so I went out and hid your talent in the ground. A right view of God always leads to faith. If you're struggling with fear today, the best antidote is to further your understanding of who God is and his true character, that he is a God that is loving and gracious, that he's not a tyrant who is hard and unforgiving. Courage, it's not the absence of fear. Courage is moving ahead in spite of your fear. I think the first two guys were probably a little afraid as well, but they didn't let their fear keep them from doing what they knew would be pleasing to their master. So they stepped out in faith. Let's look at the difference between the two servants who actually served and the one who took a dive. The first two viewed the, money as an op uh, viewed the money as an opportunity. The third guy saw it as a problem. Now, I I I'm responsible for something. I don't want to do it, but here it is. The first two invested. The third one wasted. The first two were willing to work hard and take risks. The third one took no risk. The first two were determined to make a profit. The third one was determined to not take a loss. The first two received the gift. The third one refused it. The first two wanted to advance the master's domain. The third one didn't have any interest about the master or anything having to do with his domain. The first two allowed the master's gift to change their lives. The third one allowed the master's refused to allow the master's gift to touch his life the first two saw a blessing the third guy saw a burden the first two knew the master the third guy didn't have a clue six we must use we must have what we have we must use or what we have we will lose look at verse 26 but his master answered and said, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received it back with interest. Therefore, take away the one talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. What we have we must use, or what we have we will lose. 
The master saw right through this flimsy excuse of the servant. He said, you're wicked. You're lazy. Not only that, he even says, you're lying. The guy was even lying in an excuse. He says, the problem is, in your heart, you're just a selfish, lazy bum. If you really wanted to do something, you'd have put my money in the bank. I see right through you. And those are pretty strong words, but think about this. Don't you think if he would really was afraid of the master, that that would have been all the more reason to go and do something with the money, at least putting it in the bank? He wasn't afraid of the master. That's why he just stuck it in a hole, just in case. He comes back, now I'll give him his money back. But he wasn't afraid of him, nor the consequences, because if he was, he would have at least went and put the money in the bank. The man was wicked because he deliberately re misrepresented both his master and himself. He falsely accused the master of being a hard man who reaped where he didn't sow and so on and so forth. But then on top of that, he's really lying about the whole thing because the fact is he wasn't afraid. And so he just basically says, here, here's what belongs to you. Here's what you gave me. Here's what I'm giving you back. He actually owed his employer not only the one talent, but whatever it would have earned if he had been faithful, even if it would have just been interest. Amazingly, instead of owning his guilt, he behaves as if the master should give him credit for being so cautious about it. Wickedness and laziness partner together to keep many people from full surrender and service. In the original Hebrew here, or the Greek, the combination of terms is unforgettable because they actually rhyme the two words. While the other two servants were busy and working hard, this selfish guy dug a hole. Little did he realize he was digging it for himself. You know, we all have an element of laziness in us. And our culture seems to be set on slothfulness. I just, I just read something I actually couldn't believe. And I don't even know if I want to say it with our young people up there on the thing this morning. But I seen an uh, ad just a couple of weeks ago somewhere online where Nintendo was actually looking for people to pay $100 a day to play video games all summer. Now I know somebody's like, where, where did you see that at? Lazy to play video games all day long? I am convinced that laziness is extremely dangerous to our spiritual life. Because when we think we can put something off until later, we eventually discover that one day it's going to be too late. Proverbs 6, 9 says, How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? Psalm 10, 5 says, He who gathers crops in the summer is a wise son, but he who sleeps during harvest is disgraceful. Hebrews 6, 11 through 12, We want each one of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make sure your hope is certain. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Because this third guy didn't use what he had been given, he lost it, according to verse 28. It says, the master said, take it away from him and give it to the guy who's got ten. It's the old use it or lose it principle. Don't hold on to what you have. Develop it, compound it, multiply it, and share it. And the last one, who you know and what you do will either lead to abundance or agony in the next life. Verse 29, the master said, for to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Everyone who has will be given more. Everyone who doesn't and holds back will lose even what they have. Those who bury the blessings will face agony. Jesus concludes this parable by saying that the worthless servant will be thrown outside into the darkness. This description is often used throughout the New Testament to refer to hell. Those who don't know God don't serve Him. And a lack of serving may indicate that a person has never been truly converted. And that's why Jesus refers to this third servant as worthless. 
a believer has worth because of his faith in Christ. This servant lived in the house of the master, but he didn't know the master, and he certainly didn't love him. A distinguishing mark of a true Christian is always, always going to be service and giving. If those two things are absent from your life, there is something dramatically wrong. A Christian who is not using what God gives them is a contradiction in terms. So as you think about your own life this morning, as we've looked at these seven principles, how do we line up? How do we see these things? What we have is not ours. What we're given is what we can handle. We must invest in what we've been given. A day of accountability is coming. What we do with what we have reveals our view of God. What we have we must use or what we have we will lose. And who you know will lead to either abundance or agony in the next life. How many of you ever seen the Antique Road Show? Ever seen that before? I actually enjoy watching that show, but not for some of the same reasons that some of you might. The actual worth of the, the item, some of them, is not what intrigues me because, I mean, you know, when they're not yours, why should you get all worked up about what somebody else's stuff's worth? But what always intrigues me about it is this. You always see a bunch of people that will come on there, and sometimes it seems like maybe the biggest or the brightest or the, the fanciest or the most unique or ornate looking type of items that they're just that you just see this look of anticipation because of the way this thing appears and looks it's like they can't wait to get in there and to talk to one of those appraisers and find out because they know this thing is worth millions but the amazing and ironic thing i often see on that show is most of those items like that those people leave out of there dejected and disappointment because more often than not, what they're told is, it's a nice piece, but it's a replica. It's a nice piece, but it's just a duplicate. It's a nice piece, but it's just a copy of the original. It really isn't worth much. But every now and then, you'll see somebody come in there with a little old teeny painting. It might not be hardly that big. Or a little old trinket or something that almost looks like it's still got the dust from the attic they drug it out of on it. Don't look like much. Don't look like there's hardly nothing to it. And they'll hand that to one of them appraisers, and they just, where did you get this? How long have you had it? How did it get in your family? Do you know what this is? And most of the time, that person will be like, I have no idea. This is so, and they'll go into details and talking about who made it and what kind of art or craftsman they were and all the history and all this and say, I will appraise this thing at $500,000. And that person's like, are, are you kidding? Part of me has to wonder if the judgment isn't going to be that way. That there's going to be a lot of people that look the brightest and boldest and shiniest and nicest. And when you look at the way they look on the outside, maybe even how they what they had and didn't have on earth, that you think when they come walking up before God, they're the ones that's going, well done, my. And I wonder how many of them are going to go out like some of those people thinking they've got a national treasure discovering it's nothing but replica junk with their head hung. But then there are going to be those that step up with a little item or a little nothing. Doesn't look like much. They never looked like much on earth. They didn't dress real fancy. Didn't have fancy cars or houses or anything else. But yet when they step up in front, that's when the value is going to show. That's when we're going to see what really counts and where the worth really Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us this parable to remind us that everything we have is really not ours. It's only been entrusted to us for our brief time here on this earth. That you are the master, that we are the slave or the servant or whatever term we choose to use. That, Lord, how we manage these resources truly does show how we view and see you and whether or not we're willing to use the gifts that you've given us 
or like the third guy, if it's just too much of a bother, too much out of our way, so we just dig a hole and stick them there, just in case you should come back, we'll be able to have and to hand you back that which is yours. But Father, I pray we see also through this parable that even that third servant owed much more than he was given. At least the interest on what that money would have drawn. If he would have just done something as simple as put it in the bank. But the reason we know, Father, that he didn't bother to do that is because it was too much of a bother to him. I pray today, Lord, that's not our view of you that we see you as the first two servants did, excited that you entrusted to us these gifts, these talents, these skills, these resources and abilities. And that, Lord, we live in this world knowing that we have to make our way, make ends meet each and every day, but knowing in the forefront and also maybe in the background of our thoughts every single day is that day is coming that we will stand before you and give an account for it all. And that we like these servants will even either have all that to show which we have gained from that you entrusted to us or nothing. Let us pray and hope that those words each one of us hears is the same as those first two servants. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. We ask you these in all things in Christ's holy name.